Well, thank you for joining. It's uh, 11 o'clock, our, our start time. So we're gonna get into talking about trust and accountability, how you build that in a family business. Here at Ferguson Alliance, uh, we meet every week um, as a team. We have a set agenda um, and it's designed to create uh, transparency with all of our collective and our individual results, as well as our failures. In fact, um, one of the things that we do is called blunder of the week. Each of us go around the room, including myself, and we talk about our biggest blunder for the week. And then as a team, we vote on who got the biggest blunder. And um, at first, when we started doing that, it was uh, awkward, to say the least. Uh, sometimes we might not want to really express what the real blunder was. But um, that was in the early days of us forming our, our team. And today, where we are is we have uh, an insurmountable amount of trust and accountability. And we look at this uh, sharing of blunders of the week as a learning opportunity. Because see, the way we look at uh, failing at Ferguson Alliance is we look at it as our first attempt in learning. And that's where the word or acronym of fail comes from. So we believe that our society today, we have an immense amount of erosion and trust going on. And I think most of us in business definitely would agree that it's even accelerated in the business workplace with COVID. We were remote for almost two years, and maybe some of us are still working remote. When we are away from people and interacting with people, the office social norms are disrupted. And we have a hard time innovating. We have a hard time building commodity. We have a hard time with increasing accountability. So the business leaders that we work with this is a common topic for us, are scrambling to really stop this erosion of trust in business. So today, we're gonna to explore the importance of trust in a family business and the relationship that accountability and trust have in Teamwork. Thanks for joining. My name is Rob Ferguson, and I'm, I founded the firm, oh, 20, oh, probably 12 years ago, maybe going on to 13, and, um, we all have a strong passion for family businesses. Um, you see, we're all motivated from the fact that we see the average lifespan of a family business declining over the past five decades. And so our mission is to reverse that. David Schlossberg is with me today, as well as Brandy Merrick, uh, our other two advisors. And we're glad that you're here. So our flight plan for today is this is a continuation of our prosperity plan series. I'm gonna do a very brief review of what our prosperity plan is. And then we're gonna get into our topic around trust and accountability. I'm gonna bring forward some interesting facts that I found in my research. I'm gonna to talk to you about the elements of trust and accountability that um, we help our clients establish into their business. And we're gonna talk about, well, what's the leader's responsibility? informing trust and accountability. And then we'll talk a little bit about next steps. So again, thanks for joining. Um, we have, uh, uh, my colleagues are monitoring the chat room. So if you have any questions, please um, put those in chat and uh, we'll talk about it along the way. And if for some reason we don't get to, we'll certainly have time at the end of our presentation um, to respond to any of your questions or comments. We really like to make these um, webinars interactive and um, so please uh, feel free to um, give us your thoughts and comments. Okay, so let's talk about prosperity. And we talk about this at the beginning of each of our webinars around the uh, series of prosperity. And so what is it? Well, the dictionary uh, definition is on your screen, having or characterized financial success or good fortune. So we believe it's bigger than that. And we work with each of our family business clients to help them determine what prosperity means to you, that family business owner. 
and unanimously across the board, across the industries, across all of our clients over the last 12 years, every family business has defined it as something more than just money or their individual success. It really comes around to the impact that that business is going to make on the lives of their stakeholders um, in their community. So what does prosperity mean to you is a very important question for you to consider. Because we believe that as a family business prospers, that it creates this ripple effect of prosperity, right? The employees are able to um, uh, hopefully advance their careers, maybe make more money. Suppliers of your organization, similarly, they get to grow as you grow. Customers are able to enjoy your services and products and hopefully be able to grow with those products and services and create their own prosperity. And then the communities that you work in and serve, the philanthropy opportunities are funded by family businesses and individuals. So again, prosperity is very important to us and to every family business owner because of the ripple effect that it has on our society. So we believe that every organization has a natural and predictable life cycle, and it's based on growth and time. Now, I spent a long career in the horticulture industry. So forgive me for using the little icons of a plant, but it just you know, brings me back to my roots in the horticulture industry. And so you can see that the life cycle that we have, we made it similar to that of a, a tree. It starts off as an infant, a small little seedling. Um, and then over time, and as it grows, it becomes in its youthful state. And then eventually it, it reaches its prime state where it's flourishing. And then again, over time, it reaches what we call the middle age state. And then as time goes on and as growth starts slowing or regressing, then it reaches its senior twilight, year, twilight years or death. Now, at Ferguson Alliance, we believe that we can intervene this life cycle. We believe every business can live forever. And so that's where we focus in on what we call the prosperity zone. It's this area between prime and middle age. See, we, we define the prosperity zone as where that business has finally optimized the perfect balance between being very entrepreneurial and dynamic and flexible with structure and systems. Because you see, if you allow your flexibility to overshadow your structure and systems, you will not be able to grow and scale. And vice versa, if you have too much structure in your business, you become too bureaucratic and too risk adverse to get to the growth. So finding that sweet spot, that prime spot is where Ferguson Alliance works and helps family businesses just like you listening today. Now, there are certain barriers, and I've listed those here to reaching that prime spot on your way to prosperity, but the two Two biggest barriers is number one, there's no vision, no aligned vision, no shared vision. And number two is there's no alignment or low trust in the organization. So if you're getting a lot of what are we doing, who's doing what, then maybe you haven't really fully answered why are we doing it. And so that leads us to our prosperity model. And with this prosperity model, we built this house and the roof of the house is what we call prosperity. And we, you can see that we've built three pillars that hold up the roof of, of the house of prosperity. And the foundation is the family values that are integrated with the business culture. And then on top of that foundation are the three core pillars to reaching prosperity. And that first pillar is having a shared vision and then a very robust organization that is strong and independent and then a system for managing. And so once those pillars are in place, then you have a defined legacy that is uh, growing your business as well as growing the value of the business. So with, with that said, 
we have been going through this prosperity model for the last several months, and we have talked about each of these elements um, along the way. And I would just encourage you to go back to our website. If any of these are interesting to you, um, check out that website. We have a library of webinars and you can look at any of these specific topics that we've already talked about. The first big question on, you know, how, what are you going to decide to be a, a, a business first family or a family first business? How do you establish a purpose or that impact in your business? How do you get alignment? So those are, those are foundational to having a shared vision and building a legacy that can transition from generation to generation. A couple of months ago, we transitioned over to Pillar 2, Organizational Strength, where we talked about leadershiping. And then last month, we talked about talent and, and how do you manage talent inside of a family business. And today, we're going to be talking about the last element of this second pillar, which is accountability and trust. How do you build that in an organization so you can have your culture become a competitive weapon in the marketplace? So there was a survey done um, by McKinsey. And, you know, it's interesting. I think I love to look at these kinds of surveys and, and kind of unpack what does it mean. And I know when I was a CEO and I work with CEOs every day, so does uh, our other two advisors, David and Brandy. And most CEOs are looking for a magic pill to improve performance. I guess kind of like we are with diets, perhaps. We think we can solve something with a magic pill, but we can. CEOs in this uh, McKinsey study, I think they believe that the magic pill is a reorganization. Companies are reorganizing faster and more frequently than ever before. In fact, that's what this data is saying, is that out of the, I can't remember what the number of CEOs were, but out of the CEOs surveyed, 70% of those said they are planning on a significant reorganization um, and that they were planning on having a significant reorganization in the past two years. So what we found out is in that survey is that those reorganizations, only 23% actually met the objective that they started out and, and performance improved, only 23%. And that 10% of those reorganizations also caused harm to the business. So I think no different from us looking for a magic pill to get healthy as human beings, we can probably get the same results. Some of those magic pills might actually cause us some harm to our health, or the majority of those pills are placebos and they're just not going to work. So how do we become healthy? Well, I think just like it is for us human beings, if we're trying to become healthier, it's going to require a shift in mindset. It's going to require effort. And it's going to require intense focus. And that's the same thing that happens with culture. Because in business, that is where it really starts, is with the, with the culture. And then as you work that culture, as you put the effort in, as you shift your mindset that there is no magic pill, and you have intense focus on your culture, and you start with the people, then I believe you will have a healthier business. So there's a lot of facts. And I don't know, I found some gurus to quote here on this slide that are economists and sociologists. And um, these are smart people that basically say trust is an advantage. And inside of a family business, you can use your culture as that competitive weapon in the marketplace. But family businesses specifically, they're struggling with implementing the structures and behaviors that build trust. We're gonna explore why that is and what we can do about it. So in the in companies today, I don't think that their traditional hierarchy of top-down communication is very effective. Maybe 30 years ago, it wasn't as effective as I thought it might have been. But today, information is everywhere. 
it, we are bombarded by information constantly. It's available and it's shared. And when you go into a family business, one of the difficulties is, is communication isn't shared and there are some elements of the family business that are kept top secret and on a need to know basis. And so when there is a lack of transparency on important things such as, where are we going? Why are we going there? What is my role? What is not my role? When those questions can't be answered, or even those like, well, where are we on our plan? Are we making money? Are we losing money? When those become uh, top secret, that's when trust becomes eroded. So as we think about building trust in the organization, you wanna think about how do I build trust within, with my people from a social aspect? How do I build trust in our processes? And then how do we build trust and unite around the greater good of our purpose? So with people, it's all about being open and for leaders to be vulnerable. That was probably one of my earliest learnings I had as a leader is vulnerability. I didn't know what I didn't know. Now I've had coaches along the way. I've had three, in fact, in my career, and I, all three uh, added to, to my leadership capabilities and competencies. And when I was a young leader, I learned that my vulnerability was really low. I guarantee you, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, I probably would not be sitting around the table with my colleagues talking about the biggest blunder I made for that week. More likely, I would be talking about the biggest win I had. And I'd be looking at them with rose-colored glasses talking about their biggest win. So learning to be vulnerable as a leader, learning to be open to listening to other people's thoughts and their ideas and allow them to ideate with you is powerful. <clears throat> Not only do you get better ideas, but more importantly, you're raising the level of trust in the organization. Processes, if you're not a process-oriented company, which means <clears throat> your processes are clearly documented, you understand who's managing, the boundaries in the processes, and you have good variance controls to process, if you don't have that in place, you're going to have a lack of trust in processes. So with trust and accountability, what's critically important is communication, learning how to cascade information down into the organization and establishing processes to escalate communication up in the organization. Having transparent goals. I don't think there's anything wrong sharing with your, your key leaders and your employees. And granted, it's, it, it depends on what information you want to share to the level. But what, where you're going with the company, what are your strategic intents? How are you going to measure your progress along the path? And are we a healthy company? Are we healthy and viable? That needs to be shared. And there are multiple ways to share that where you don't have to break confidentiality or you don't have to give out trade secrets or you don't have to worry about leaks going to your competition. We're happy to talk to you about how do you do that here at Ferguson Alliance, just give us a call. That tends to be a big question that we get from a lot of family businesses. And then lastly, how do you build trust in your purpose? Um, I would recommend on purpose to go back to our library of webinars and listen to the, the impact webinar that we had probably about five or six months ago. But there is a process of developing a purpose for your company. And it is an iterative process and it takes time. And most business leaders get frustrated with the process we use. But it's that process of iterative, you know, working with the key leaders, working with the family board members, working with the managers, even working with all the employees and having that go iterate throughout, throughout the organization. It's not an exercise in wordsmithing, it's an exercise in alignment. And then once you have that shared purpose, now your employees have the trust that they can 
be free to innovate inside of that. I hope that makes sense to you. So let's look at accountability. See, accountability and trust are hand in glove, in, in our opinion. Accountability is at the core of building trust. We know that. The cornerstone of trust is reliability and consistency. But that's the same for accountability. See, the only way a family business is going to have long-term business success where it can transition from one generation to the next generation is it has these elements in place. Think about it, consistency and reliability. If those are, are missing, you're going to lack accountability. And as accountability deteriorates, trust will deteriorate. 20,000 Navy recruits every year want to become a Navy SEAL. Only 250 make it per year. 250 out of 20,000. There's been a lot of studies done on how the Navy SEALs perform under extreme conditions, under unimaginable stress. How do they get that kind of performance? Well, the SEALs have concluded that trust is more important than skill or performance. See, they, they've learned over time, they can teach skill. They can train skill. You, you can't train character. Trust is character. And so they would prefer, what I'm showing you with this little graph, is they would prefer to have a Navy SEAL team member that has medium performance or medium scale skill, but high trust. So I want you to think of something. Who in your organization has the most skills, but is the least trusted? What's that person's label? Think about it for a moment. High skill, probably the smartest guy sitting at the table, smartest or the most skilled woman, at the table that's a subject matter expert, but you have the least amount of trust with them. Well, at Alliance, that is how we define the biggest jerk in the room, as you think about it. So I agree with the Navy SEALs. I agree that it's all about trust over performance. So why is that? Well. You cannot separate trust in, from character. It's, it's, they're not two separate things. This, you know, the Navy SEAL, one Navy SEAL said, look, I may trust you with my life, but do I trust you with my money and my wife? Yeah, well, that's a pretty interesting question. So what, what, the, what the Navy SEAL is saying is in reality, if I cannot trust you with my money or with my wife when I'm gone. How am I going to fully trust you with my life when we're on a mission? So someone who is not trusted because of their character cannot fully be trusted in any functional role. So you can't separate the two. That's why trust is more important than performance. The second reason is, is the lower the amount of trust you have in an organization, the slower everything is going to move forward. The manager or the leader is spending significant time explaining and re-explaining and discussing and looking at options when there's low levels of trust. So as trust increases, speed of action increases in your business. So when you're under stress in an organization, you are going to see a lack of trust. I mean, it's just, it, it clearly does get amplified. And so if all of a sudden your, your profits are declining or you lost a big account, um, performance is important, but because of that stress, if, if, if you don't have the uh, fundamental basics around trust, around character, um, it will get amplified under difficult times. Lastly, I just think it makes life a lot more fun and it makes work 
not work, more enjoyable. Now, I've been very fortunate over the last decade, more than a decade, to be able to do something that I am passionate about doing um, and hanging out with people that I really enjoy hanging out with and building a relationship with those, both in my team as well as with my clients and my other network providers. So to me, I don't want to go to work every day. And wouldn't it be great that if everybody had that same opportunity, there was the level of trust was that high in every organization. Think about the joy and the, the, uh, the reduced turnover of employees you would have if you put trust over performance. You can teach performance and skills. You got to hire the character. Yeah. So <clears throat> too many times at Alliance, we've heard our family business leaders say things like, trust me, or don't worry about that upset. I'll set, I'll set the record straight. So we see family business leaders using trust instead of building trust. That's one of the most, the worst thing as a leader can say is, trust me, it'll be okay. Nobody trusts a leader when they say that. Nobody does. So how do you nurture trust? Well, these five elements are elements that will help you uh, build trust, nurture trust over time. As, as leaders, think about it as like a capital account. Um, you want, as you try to build equity in your business, you try to build capital in your business, you need to be working tirelessly and building trust. And you can lose trust as well. So when actions or behaviors are consistent with these uh, five components, your trust level is going to increase. But when you, as the leader, when you move away from that, or you contradict any of these five elements, then your trust account is gonna be depleted. So it's important that you stress and reinforce trust in your business cultures. We're currently working with several clients in um, establishing culture of excellence in their organization. And it does start with um, learning how to build accountability in, in your business. And it is not uncommon for our business leaders when we first meet them to just say, I need to hire somebody to do accountability training. That's all we need. We just need the consulting group or an advisory firm to come in and teach everybody that works for me how to be accountable. Well, how does that work? How do we, how do we teach accountability to the folks that are probably the most accountable in the organization when their supervisor, their boss, their leader, or the owner of the company isn't accountable, doesn't show up to meetings on time, doesn't reply, timely to emails, doesn't deliver on a pay increase that they told they were gonna get. It, it destroys the culture. So the lack of accountability destroys the trust. So this little graphic here with this gentleman leaving his office with his personal items in his box is something that we're seeing a lot the great resignation. Now it's called the quiet resignation. We are seeing employees leave jobs faster than ever before at, at, at the highest records possible. I was listening to a news program today about a Gallup survey that said 50% of the workers are leaving their jobs or intend to leave their jobs. That's, that's unbelievable to me. I, I don't know, I, I need to do some more research on that. That's hard to believe. But regardless, we do know a lot of people are leaving their jobs, but I don't think that's true. I don't think they're leaving their jobs. They're leaving their manager, they're leaving their boss, they're leaving their leader, they're leaving the owner. So, and I think owners know that. So why is it so darn hard then for owners to install accountability into their business? I think number one, in a family business, 
You struggle with accountability because you're afraid to hurt your sister's feelings. Because you and your sister are working together with your father and mother. Or perhaps if you actually held your uncle accountable to his lack of work or effort, that somehow you're going to get punished for that. There will be hell to pay if you were to do that. And then the other reason is, is because there's a lot of inconsistency in family businesses. But if you go back to our very first webinar, the big decision, are you going to be a business first family or a family first business? Go back and listen to that webinar. It won't take you long. But that is the fundamental question that every family business needs to answer. And if you answer it, that we are going to be a business first family, then these issues melt away and you can increase accountability in your organization quickly. So how do we put this to action? There's two buckets to, to building accountability into a company, having the right structure and having the right behaviors. So what do I mean by that? So the right structure is all about role description, you know, clear ownership of who owns what decisions and very transparent goals of what everybody's working on and how do those goals stack on top of one another to get us to the primary goal at the end of the year, at the end of our five-year strategic plan. When I talk about structures, how do we communicate and how do we manage the business, which are coordinated meeting schedules that are perfectly aligned with your system for managing? And I, we always get the resistance, oh, we have too many meetings, or we don't have time for meetings. Well, if you're not meeting, how do you improve? If you're not meeting, how do you communicate? If you're not meeting, how do you forecast the future or manage risk? If you're not meeting, how do you deal with barriers or upsets? It's, it's just beyond my understanding how you don't have meetings. Now, if you subscribe to having meetings or you just have a lot of meetings, but if they're not aligned, to a defined system for managing, then you're gonna be wasting a lot of time. So that's what I mean about the right structure for getting uh, accountability in place. And then as we talked about earlier, the communication systems for escalating and cascading information. And when you, because you're spending time in meetings, again, the right structure, make sure you've got good meeting practices put in place. And we can talk to you more about how to do that and set that up. So that's the right structure, the right behaviors. Well, making sure that, first of all, when you hire somebody, you're hiring for character. I would, again, sacrifice some skills for having the character or the alignment in the culture. Their, their personal values align with your company culture. And then when you're in the business, when you make a request for information, or for a task to be completed, make sure it's done in a clear way, that it's, that it's got time frames and it's got deliverables. And when you're receiving that request, make sure that you are, are accepting that. And if you can't accept it, if you cannot meet that, then offer up an alternative. I can't get it to you by Tuesday, this next Friday work. See, simple language of accountability. And if, I mean, life happens, you're going to miss a commitment, don't blow it off. Be accountable and recommit and talk about how you're going to correct it. And then making it known when somebody is not being accountable. Work directly with that person first. But if you can't get that person to, uh, to honor those commitments made to you, then you have to ha escalate that up. But you do it in a responsible way, right? So some food for thought, some things to think about your family business. How would you rate your culture of accountability? If you thought about a one to six scale, is it a, is it a one where you don't have anybody that's accountable for anything except for you, and you are the center of the decision-making process, only you can make decisions on uh, what products to buy, 
what office supply company you're going to buy your office supplies from and what customer credit limits you're going to set. If you find yourself there, your, your accountability is probably pretty low. Or is it high? You've got a good system for managing in place. You've got good communication structures. You have very escalation processes. Do you have those things in place? What gets in the way of accountability in your family business? Is it you? You as a leader. Um, as you as a leader, are you using we statements or I statements? Are you giving credit to the employees or are you taking the credit? So where, where are you with uh, your personal accountability and what's getting in the way of your accountability? And then how is it affecting not only your family business success, your accountability, but also your family harmony? How is that working? If you would like to learn more about how we work with businesses just like yours to help them improve accountability and raise a level of trust in their organization so they can reach their zone of prosperity, give us a call. Um, you can reach out to us uh, by email or you can uh, contact us through our website. I'll have that information up here shortly on the next screen. But I really do appreciate you listening and joining our, our call today. In summary, trust and accountability are interdependent. They, they are hand in glove with one another and leaders own it. Leaders create the structure and the behaviors for enhancing their results through trust and accountability. That's our um, prosperity model there on the screen. And let me just uh, see if there's any questions uh, in the chat room, I'll ask, uh, Patty, just tell me if we've got any questions. We do have a question. Okay. If you know that you have a trust or accountability problem, uh, where's the best place to start? Like, is there one thing that you've talked about today that would have the biggest impact? Yep, um, self-awareness on that leader. Um, so if it's the, the leader themselves, the owner of the business is saying, look, we got a trust and accountability issue here. I, I think the leader would be very wise to find a mirror and to self-reflect. And, and you can't, it's really hard to do that by yourself. Uh, that's where I would suggest bringing in a, a coach or a business advisor to, to help you um, realistically and authentically look at where you are with trust and accountability, first and foremost. That would be where I would start. So follow-up question to that. If uh, if the the person who sees the trust and accountability problem is not um, right at the top of the food chain, is there any hope <laughs> that somebody a little bit lower down in the organization can have an impact with this? I think there always is hope. And as we've talked about in the past, everybody's a leader. <clears throat> and it doesn't mean that's the position. We call that leadership. So... I would encourage any employee that if they believe there's a strong lack of trust or accountability happening in their team or their department, that they have the, ob the obligation or responsibility to escalate that up and bring that issue, but bring it with real examples, not in a way that's condemning, but in a way that's showing how it's causing slower decisions perhaps, or maybe uh, less than, than uh, great results. But I would escalate that up, but when I ask, but I would escalate it is I would do it responsibly, meaning that I would have examples of how this is impacting the overall performance of the company. Thank you. Was that the last question? That was the last question. Uh, I did get a, a private message about uh, recordings and uh, we will send the recording out to everyone who registered. So if you want to review this or if you missed part of it, it will be made available. Great, thanks for that announcement, Patty. And again, <clears throat> if uh, anything was interesting here and you'd like to talk to one of us, uh, myself, Rob Ferguson, Brandy Merrick or David Schlossberg, please give us a call. This is our toll-free number on the screen. You can also visit our website. Um, we have a lot of information about family businesses on, that's available free 
uh, for you. We have white papers, we have uh, webinars, we have podcasts. Uh, so please uh, uh, look through the resources that we have. Um, and then you can also just email us. Um, you can email me directly, rob at ferguson-alliance.com, or you can send it to our general email inbox, hello at ferguson-alliance.com. So we're easy to get in touch with, and uh, we'd love to talk to you some more about building trust and accountability in your organization. Thank you so much for attending, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Have a great day.